and get some of this out of the way. Share my screen here. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody. Just wanted to mention a couple things real quickly before we get started. Uh, got quite a few on the webinar today, so we mute everybody, cuts down on a lot of background noise. So in the Zoom, um, where you logged in, you've got a dialogue box. There's a question and answer box there. So if you have questions as myself and Carolyn walk through this information over the next 45 or 50 minutes, post questions when we get to the end, we'll answer any questions that you have. Um, otherwise, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm Mike McCarty, um, President and CEO of Safe Hiring Solutions, Safe Visitor Solutions. We're based in a suburb of Indianapolis. I, prior to that, I spent about eight years as a violent crime detective with the city of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, core business model, we do background screening, visitor management, um, a, a lot of products, work with K-12 schools all across the United States, Partner with large, large insurance carriers, Liberty Mutuals, Wright Insurance, Highland Astra, Brotherhood Mutual. So a lot of the church, uh, or I'm sorry, the school uh, insurers, um, we partner with them. Also joined today uh, by Caroline Ramsey Hamilton. She's out of Parkland, Florida. And so what Carolyn's been doing for the last 20 plus years, is security risk assessments um, and what we're really focusing on here today. So I'll let Carolyn tell you a little bit more about herself here in a minute, but just kind of, you know, to give you a flavor for um, where we're going today, a lot of stuff going on around the country, We've seen a lot of legislatures really looking at what do we do, how do we help schools, money being allocated, we need to do audits. It's a lot of the language I'm seeing is audit as opposed to assessment. And uh, as I talk to schools and school resource officers, even in some of our schools that are what I would consider uh, really, you know, have sophisticated security programs and plans in place, when it comes to the assessment process, they're pulling stuff off the internet and going through checklists. And so what we want to walk through today is really um, how it should be done, how you standardize the process, how the security assessment is really a living, breathing document and process. It's not a one-time event that happens, but that it is the foundation for every school that provides the roadmap for where you should be heading. And, you know, without a, a quality assessment, then what happens is you're going to gravitate towards a lot of things being pushed at you right now, you know, through vendors and things that quite honestly you may not need today and you may never need. Um, and so that assessment really kind of brings that together. We use a really uh, diverse group of advisors. Uh, Tony, uh, as you see here on the screen, Tony Vespa is one of our advisory board members. Uh, Tony's a former Navy SEAL. We got Paul Dvorak, who's with the Secret Service. Dottie, who is Director of Security at Fort Wayne Community Schools. It's a school district with about 30,000 students, 4,500 employees, uh, urban environment, 63 buildings she's responsible for. Mike is a systems engineer that's been in the security uh, business for probably 25 or 30 years. Cal's re retired FBI from uh, the Phoenix area. We get you know, information experts from large schools. Randy's the director of security now at Lake Stevens, Washington. We've got law enforcement. Caroline is also on our board. Um, and so what we do is try to bring together some really deep thinking uh, experts that help really bring together a model and a toolkit for what schools need. Uh, if you've not heard of a concept, uh, Left of Bang, a book was written several years ago, it really documents a program that the Marines started uh, five or six years ago. It's a Marine Combat Hunter program. The idea about Left of Bang is as the Marines were moving into Iraq in particular in these more urban environments and, and you know, fighting wars in an urban environment, 
the normal way of doing war has changed dramatically. And so what was happening is, you know, they were finding themselves in a situation where they couldn't identify who the uh, enemy was. And so they started a program, this Marine Combat Hunter program, to get left of bang. And left of bang simply means we want to get left of an active shooter, left of an event, left of anything before the bomb goes off, so to speak. And so it involves a lot of situational awareness, uh, intuition, recognizing anomalies. And that's kind of the foundational stuff with the security assessment is coming in and really looking at everything. What are the things we can do today? What are the things we can do over the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months to keep us or get us left of bang? Um, how do we create these wider safe zones and perimeters around our schools? Um, when we start to look at, you know, how do you secure the building and how do you secure the area around the building and now all of a sudden we're getting on the bus, how do we secure students and employees when they're on our buses and so I use a lot of terminology about how, you know, the, the mirrors is, you know, prevention or getting left of bang. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in the media right now is a lot of right of bang discussions. You know, how do I handle an active shooter when they're in our hallway? Uh, and so there's so much energy and focus right now being spent on, you know, what, the, what happens when you actually have an event. I can tell you uniformly, when you look at our team, our advisory board, our partners, uh, the groups that we work with, one of the key components is they all come from a prevention mindset. If you're not in a prevention mindset, you're not really going to be working with us. Um, so we want to put a lot of energy in prevention, and then we want to be prepared if anything is to get breached. And so that's really kind of a secret service model. We've got a couple uh, agents that uh, interact with us as partners or advisory board members. And that's really what they do when they get out in front of, you know, uh, protecting the president or the vice president or some other uh high value target, they spend an enormous amount of time on the advanced work that is going in doing everything they can to prevent having a situation, um, you know, that's right of bang or that they have to uh, uh, deal with an active shooter or some incident like that. So take a deep breath. Let's really kind of focus on, you know, where we're going, how we get there, uh, and how we can put some of these you know, practices into play. But if we look at active shooter studies, the most recent by the FBI, what are we looking at? Business and schools still combine for the vast majority of active shooter situations in the United States. The good news is when we look at this and break this down is uh, the FBI in 2017 issued a report, you can pull this off the internet, making prevention a reality that these active shooter incidents are not spontaneous, they're not emotion driven, they're not impulsive crimes, you know, emanating from a person's immediate anger or fear. Uh, a lot of times uh, we think that they are. I spent 20 years working in domestic violence movement, both starting one of the first police-based uh, intervention programs with the Nashville, Tennessee Metropolitan Police Department. And what we found was by intervening, doing advance work, getting involved early at really early stages before it had grown at, uh, to a, a really dangerous level, that we reduced our domestic homicide rate by over 50% within the first year of starting this program. And so a lot of what we're gonna share is based on doing things to help prevent. It's a real paradigm shift. And I know a lot of times as schools, we want to turn and, and, you know, reach out to local law enforcement for help. And a lot of your legislatures are really, you know, that's what they're doing right now, too. How do you engage law enforcement to help you? I come out of that culture. I was a police officer. My dad, my grandfather, I've got a brother that's still a detective. My wife was a police officer. I mean, I come from a long line of police officers. But Law enforcement historically is very reactive, meaning, you know, it's law enforcement. I'm going to, I'm going to enforce the law after something has happened or been broken. And so we've got to have a paradigm shift when we're looking at how you put prevention models in place. But if I just look at schools, we know that 85% of active, uh, you know, school shootings 
involve threat signs, behaviors prior to the shooting. We also know over half the mass shootings are related to domestic violence, which was the San Bernardino school incident uh, 18 months ago or two years ago. And so they're not impulsive events. And that's where this assessment but it's gotta be a quality uh, security assessment. That's where they become this critical uh, component to where we're going. So what we're trying to do is help you assemble a toolkit. We're focused on the security assessment today because that's the foundation. But within that toolkit, you know, you're gonna develop, you know, you, you may have to review policy or develop policy. You know, schools need threat assessment teams and we can talk through that on future webinars background checks, not just background checks, but how are you doing them? Who is doing them? Who's being background checked? How frequently? We just uh, launched a new uh, background screening tool last week uh, for schools across the country, uh, only one of its kind, and it's real-time monitoring. And so we've uh, actually integrated with 80% of the jails in the United States. And so now when an employee or a volunteer or a contractor is arrested, you're going to get notified in real time. DUI, bus driver, you're not allowing them to drive on Monday morning. Now you're, uh, in, you know, school policies and investigative procedures kick in. You know, how do you manage the flow of people in and out of your organization? Visitor management, access control systems. You know, how can students report, you know, being able to uh, allow them a platform and it's gonna be text-based. Kids text, they don't pick up the phone and call, they don't walk into the principal's office. Uh, they need a, the ability to be able to communicate with the style of communication that they use and it has to be anonymous. You know, integrated communication pieces training, 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 and then look at, you know, what are some hardware construction or renovation uh, items that we can do. But those are going to be a longer roadmap when you start talking about how do we change or create vestibules. And so today we want to focus on, you know, how do you do the assessment? How do you get this uh, assessment so that you have the foundation for where you need to go? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll let that go over to Carolyn and let her share her screen and take it from here. Okay, hello everybody. How is everybody today? I hope you're doing great. Mike, can you see my screen okay? Perfect. Wonderful. Well, my name is Caroline Ramsey Hamilton and I live in Parkland. And I've been working with in risk assessments for 25 years. So I started out, the FBI had me move from uh, LA to Washington, DC, when they opened the Criminal Investigation Bureau, the uh, siege of in West Virginia. And I came in and did the risk assessment for them. I had had a whole background in risk assessment up to that time. A lot of it I used on political campaigns of all things, including electing Sonny Bono as mayor of Palm Springs and then to Congress. But uh, I got, once I got into Washington, D.C., then I started working for the Defense Department. I worked for the technical working group, counterterrorism operations, all sorts of things. Ended up uh, 20 years later, my son had moved to Florida, had twins. They, could, they were premature, you know, can't you come down and help out? So I moved. They, moved, they bought their first house in Parkland. So I moved about half a block away, and I'm half a block from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And those two premature twins are now eight years old and they were on lockdown that day from eight o'clock in the morning when they got there until six o'clock, 6.30 that night. So even though I've been doing this all, all this time, I, 30 years probably, I still just felt it viscerally how horrible it is. And being on the risk assessment side, it just infuriates me some of the things that we found out and I'm gonna tell you about today. So this is my, my background. I've worked in a lot of industry, most of, most of it's counterterrorism, uh, active shooter, anti-terrorism. I wrote the requirements for the Coast Guard for risk and vulnerability assessment after 9-11. I worked for the Department of Interior, how to do risk assessments on 77,000 dams that they were afraid terrorists were gonna blow up and they were gonna flood cities and kill people. And uh, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of hospitals and schools all around the world. So this is just a little look at who is uh, who has a 
problem with active shooter based on, on the mass shootings in 2016 and 2017, very, very similar. And so you can see the three worst are Florida, California, and Illinois. And the reason that they, they made it into the, the worst category was because Florida at that time had the Pulse nightclub shooting way before they had the uh, Parkland shooting. California had the San Bernardino shooting in Chicago's in Illinois. So those were the, the ones that were the worst. The gray ones are places that are, that are less scary. So you can see a lot, of, uh, a lot of things in the light pink there, including Indiana. So this is, uh, so one of the things that I do is I send out these things called risk alerts and you can write to me, you'll see my email address later, or you can send a note to Mike and he can get it to me. But basically, this is what I sent out last week because I just, I had, when I read this report, I had smoke coming out of my ears. So we do the, I, I write the risk alerts and send them out almost every single day. This is one I wrote last week about Parkland. And the title of this one was, of course it happened here. And uh, Mike already talked about the Secret Service and how they had, they're, they're all about preparation. So before Alan Greenspan, when he was head of the Fed, I was at Cleveland Clinic the day he came in to speak to everybody. He made them bring a fire truck in and, and show them how they would evacuate him in like a bucket truck if anything happened inside. I mean, they're in the Secret Service did that. They're all about that. So it turns out there are a bunch of Secret Service agents right in Parkland. So one of them was asked by the, uh, by the management of that school 60 in January to take a look around and see if they had any vulnerabilities that might cause uh, any kind of an incident or make them less able to respond. So this agent, Steve Wexler, he went out and started looking at the school. And he, what he did was he took yellow sticky notes, big yellow sticky notes, and he stuck them everywhere there was a problem. So the first thing he found was he was able to walk into the school from a housing development in the back because the gates were unlocked. Why were they unlocked? Because the guy who was supposed to lock them up when school started was too lazy to go out there. So he just didn't do it. Students didn't have identification badges. A fire alarm could accidentally send students streaming in the hall. They hadn't done active shooter drills. And he also, he briefed the school and he said, this stuff is blatantly obvi obvious, you've got to fix this. And he never heard from the school again. So his, his recommendations were the gate should be locked, they should wear ID badges. And the school's policy in writing says that the, the gates are to be locked during the day, but they weren't. And of course, that's how Nicholas Cruz got into the school was he walked in because the gates were open. Active shooter drills, he said, should be routine, but the students hadn't been involved in an active shooter drill. Any adult should be able to lock down the school, but they said that was a protocol, but nobody did it. They were waiting for somebody else to do it. And the students should not immediately evacuate students for a fire alarm without making sure there's a fire because what he did was he set off the fire alarm, students ran into the halls and it was real easy to pick them off. So in our lessons learned here, if you have security weaknesses in your school that are identified by an expert, take their advice and fix the issues that were identified. We see this everywhere where you go in and people wanna look at the weaknesses and none of their policies are even implemented. So a good place to start is what are we supposed to be doing? What's our policy? What's the industry standard? We have all that information. And the other thing, liability increases if staff were warned 60 days before an incident that there were existing weaknesses and they were never fixed. In fact, uh, MD Anderson uh, Hospital down in Cancer Center down in Texas, they got a $4.3 million fine because they wrote themselves their own risk assessments and wrote up that they needed to do this. They needed to add encryption to some of their laptops and things like that. They wrote themselves up four years in a row and they never fixed anything. If you do that, that like triples the liability of the school district. So these are just some things that I'm sure will be familiar to you. This is the, these are other of my risk alerts. In fact, this is the one where that I sent, and Mike saw it, and that's how we met. But uh, no, Noblesville, Indi no, Noblesville, Indiana, this was the student who came in, shot the 13-year-old that he was in love with, shot her teacher. And uh, these are the students coming out. Again, he was taken into custody immediately, which was great because it reduced the number of casualties. And they had a plan there. They worked the plan. They had the uh, students hide initially and then evacuate to a local high school. 
And having a plan that you actually practice reduces mistakes and eliminates confusion when this happens. This is uh, another one in Gray Hills High School in Maryland. This came uh, about one month after Parkland. And again, this was another shooter entered the school, shot a female student, shot another, another man. They're both in the hospital. And uh, again, they had no access control. So the student just walked right in with his gun right in front of everybody. This is the, the next shooting that was in Santa Fe, Texas. Uh, another mass shooting where quite a few people were uh, killed. This is a 17 year old, took his dad's gun, modeled Columbine like many of these people do, wore its trench coat, had his dad's Remington 970 and a 38 caliber pistol and he shot 23 people inside of school. 10 were killed, 13 were injured. The police responded within four minutes and had a gun battle with the subject. And apparently the shooter one of the worst parts of this is he yelled you who as he started shooting people in the classroom. And the other, this was a 20th school shooting of, of 2018. That was in March. So what happened in Parkland? So Parkland had to, the week before the shooting, which was on February 14th, Valentine's Day, it had just won the award as the safest school in the United States, safest city in the United States. And you can see this is one of the uh, indicators we use out of 100. It was an 85, that means it was safer than 85 of all US cities. And again, the violent crime was low, the crime rate was very low, and, and the next week this happened. This also shows you Parkland compared to the national average. So this purple is Parkland, how low the crime is there. And this is the, this is the standard US data in the green. This is what Parkland looks like. So it's got a lot, it's got condos, it's got single family homes, it doesn't have a lot of commerce. It's not very developed. It just got this normal kind of streets. And I said it was 95% safer than the rest of the US. This is Miami, Florida, which is 30 miles south of here. And it's a four out of 100. That means that 96% of US cities are safer than Miami. And this is just what the other side looks like. So here's the national average down here. And you can see Miami is higher. It's even twice as high as Florida, which is also higher than the US national average. So, you know, if you could have a school like that that had money, had an affluent, uh, affluent neighborhoods, everything, what went wrong in Parkland? So the first thing was the identified problems that they had were not fixed. So they knew these things were wrong, they'd been reported, and they, they just didn't even look at them. They did nothing about them. They also had a general lack of security control. So the kind of security controls that I just look at, I don't have, I don't even need to use a checklist. I can go in and see immediately. Can anybody just walk right in here? Can I walk in with a gun? Is anybody even going to notice that I'm in the building? Or can I go farther in the building? Can I walk right in a classroom coming in a side door, or back door? The other problem here was that there was so much advance notice that the FBI completely dropped the ball on the background check as I'll show you in a minute. Broward County got many, and that's the county that, Parkland, that uh, Parkland is in, did not follow up with the investigations based on people who called them and told them this guy wanted to be a school shooter. The sc and then the shooting happened and the, he was able to walk right in with the right and the back door with an assault rifle. The school, because none of the back doors were locked, which they all should have been, they didn't have cameras or door alarms or anything. So there was nobody alerted when he came in that back door with a gun. If it had the typical monitoring camera set up, they could have heard that door alarm, looked at the picture and seen him walk in with a gun, stopped him right there. They also had a school resource officer who was a former uh, detective and law enforcement officer, and he didn't even enter the building. He heard the shooting, he drew his gun and he stayed outside. There were three more deputies there from Broward County they draw their weapons and they stayed in the parking lot. They also did not go in. They could not communicate between the police and the county. They had communications problems on their walkie talkies. They had emergency techs who could have stopped the bleeding for some of the people laying on the floor in the school. They weren't allowed to enter the school. The, the administration told them that only law enforcement could enter the school. So the emergency techs waited outside to people bled to death. They also he used the AR-15 rifle, made such large wounds that almost everybody who was shot died. Because as my doctor friend tells me, when they shoot a hole in you the size of a baseball, there's no arteries to connect. There's, it's not like a tourniquet to uh, 
you know, with what tear in an artery, there's, there's no artery left to look at. So I'll tell you how I found out about Parkland was I was, I had been networking in Miami that day. I drove back to my house and I stopped at the Target about half a block away. And I had gone in Target, came out loading groceries in the back of my car. And all of a sudden I see two police helicopters, 15 emergency vehicles, five ambulances and 20 police cars all heading north on the two streets on either side of the Target. I thought it was maybe an accident on the freeway or something. So I went in the car and turned on my phone and that's when I saw what had happened. So again, I know it can happen at your school. Every place that I go and talk to people, and unfortunately people have this bad habit of calling me after something terrible happens, just once I, I like to be called ahead of time so we can make sure nothing terrible happens. And again, this is, has nothing to do with gun control, putting armed officers in the classrooms are not gonna help anything. It's not about politics, it's not about the NRA, it's not about arming teachers, none of those things. There's common sense things you can put in place to protect the students, the staff, the teachers, your healthcare, the patients, the visitors, employees, by having the right controls in place. And these controls will 100% prevent these things from happening. So again, you heard about the deputy. The problem was that uh, within 20 minutes of this, they, they got the surveillance video and it showed that the deputy, Scott Peterson, stayed outside the building while the gunman was inside shooting. The whole shooting, and they shot uh, 17 kids and injured another, they killed 17 and injured another 17, lasted less than six minutes. So that's why it's not enough time to get police there. So whatever you have there at the time is that's what's gonna be. This guy was a school resource officer. He was armed, he had bullets. He chose not to go in. All these people got killed. He's already been sued. Uh, again, the weaknesses they had, they had no access control. All the back doors were wide open. They didn't have any kind of metal scanner. And everybody goes, oh no, we don't wanna make our schools like a prison. You don't have to make your schools like a prison. The metal scanners can be invisible. They can be underneath the floor now, just walk over them. They can be a couple of slim rails on either side like you use when you walk in a movie theater. And they're practically indetectable, but they will go off if they, if they read that there's a lot of metal going through, and then you can check the backpack. So there was also no proper response plan for law enforcement. According to the law enforcement policy, all those sheriffs who were there with their guns strong were supposed to go in and disable the shooter. That was their first most important duty, and none of them did it. And there was no monitoring, so officers couldn't see what was do happening. This was a four-story building where all this was unfolding and it had 3,200 students at that school. And there was no lockdown of the building. So there, even though it's a requirement for all schools in Florida, that day there was no lockdown. This is, again, the guy was able to walk in without a badge, without anything, with a gun right into the school, start shooting people, and then just walk out. He just got in a line with the other kids and he walked right out of the school with them. They caught him a couple blocks away and that's him in the maroon shirt being captured. They didn't investigate the many, many dozens of complaints that they got about him. He got, he was so bad, he finally got expelled from Marjorie Stone Douglas High School. There was no follow-up to see if he was angry or what he was doing. He wrote on his website he wanted to be a school shooter. And the FBI had been contacted and they made a series of mistakes. And they said that they're reviewing how they're gonna handle it in the future. But here's just, I thought this is one of the most chilling things was a letter from his aunt. And she, she said, I, I knew something was wrong with this guy. I called the operator and she transferred me. You know, he's only 16, but he's got the middle capacity of a 12 to 14 year old. His mother just passed away. He started off saying he wanted to kill himself. So I called Parkland Police Department, spoke to an officer, gave him my number, gave him all my information, told him how he said, now he wants to kill people. And he put that on his Instagram account. And I'm afraid something's gonna happen. And he's got money. He's got an insurance policy coming up for $25,000. And somehow he got his mother's debit card and uh, took money after she passed away, took all the social security money out, bought all these rifles and ammunition, posted pictures of them on Instagram. And the family, you know, the distant cousin and myself are very concerned because I just want somebody to know so they can look into it if they think it's worth going into. If not, I know I have a clear conscience 
if he just takes off and starts shooting places up. So this, again, was way before the, um, this was in January. This was way before it happened. And again, it was just ignored and not even looked at. One of the students, a couple of the students who were interviewed by the media said that they knew he had guns because he showed everybody in the school pictures of all his guns on his phone. He also had pictures of animals that he had tortured and killed. And he posted on Instagram, I want to be a professional school shooter. And at the time, again, we talked about the resource officer who hid behind a staircase with his gun drawn. All the students and staff died. My two grandchildren, Elijah and Maya, uh, one of Elijah's best friends, father was the coach who held the door open for the kids and he got killed and died too. I've been to his house. Uh, three other deputy sheriffs were sitting in their car at the scene and they never entered the building. So this is just the information about how they were told by a dispatcher not to enter the building, even though the policy is everyone should have gone in. Every single person knew the shooter was in the building. You have to stop the threat. And that's what they were required to do, didn't do it. So again, the, that dispatcher told them to form a perimeter instead of going in. Uh, and that, and so the sheriff is, is under a lot of pressure now because the, active shooter procedure that they've been trained on calls for law enforcement to confront shooters immediately rather than secure a scene. And all I'm saying with this is just because people are there on the property two feet away and have guns, it doesn't mean that they are brave enough to walk in and, and risk getting shot themselves. And again, the school resource officer, he resigned the day after the shooting and uh, so he could keep his full attention. Another problem was they couldn't communicate by radio. So once they got to the school, just like in 9-11 in the stairwells, they could not communicate with each other. And they could, the sheriffs couldn't talk to the police. Police couldn't talk with the sheriffs. And it, again, it, it's always a big problem. So that's why we do drills. That's why we check all these things ahead of time. It's where we view all these controls to make sure that the, any interoperability issue is fixed before there's an incident. Because once you have an incident, it's too late. So what could have prevented? So that's sort of my uh, angst about that. But what could we done that could have prevented this? And so, again, security, safety, emergency response controls need to be added to all these facilities. And there was a bill that came out like in, in the Florida legislature that came out three weeks later, and they did a lot, a lot of money to fix these things. But in my opinion, as Mike said also, it doesn't help to to send somebody out and have him give you a list of 135 things that are wrong with your school. That's not no help at all. What we want to do is we want to see what the controls are in place. We want to see how they're working. We want to, we want to make sure that they're working as required and that you have a risk assessment that says that. And so that's what I do. Active shooter risk assessments, they need to be updated every year. And it tells you exactly where you are in security what you need to improve, how much it's going to cost, and how much it's going to save you. And then all these controls are ranked by return on investment. What can you do tomorrow morning that's going to give you the most, safe, most, uh, the most protection for the least amount of money? And I am also on a bunch of committees with uh, Palm Beach Police Chief and a lot of, a lot of police chiefs. And we're building a, a nationwide coalition, a public-private partnership that we're going to be offering to to um, different schools around the country to use our resources, our many resources that we're putting together. So one of the things we do is we test the controls to make sure they're working the way that they're supposed to. Uh, and I would say probably 50% of the time people pay for these controls, they, configure, they don't configure them correctly. So the emergency comes and the controls don't work. We saw this in Oregon at Umpqua College up there where they had just put in a new uh, system called Blackboard uh, communication system, supposed to alert everybody by email and text when anything happened. And it just didn't work. They had a shooting, 10 people were killed, and they kept walking into the lecture hall because the alert they sent out didn't work. The, the software didn't work. So we confirm that these things are working, and then we identify all the things that are missing. So these are the, these are my list of some of the must-have controls. One is access control. So if you, can't, if you can't control access to a facility, you don't have security. So this is going to access control of whoever comes in. Could be parents, could be staff, could be students, visitors. 
one single entrance that everybody has to go through. Even if you don't have metal scanners there, you should have a single primary entrance anyway. Obviously, looking at somebody and trying to guess whether they have a gun in their backpack, that's not going to be as effective as a metal scanner, even though since this incident, Parkland has gone to clear backpacks. I even have a clear backpack now. They walk through with their backpacks. People can look right in them and see what's in there. The other thing is cameras. So most people have some cameras, but maybe not enough. Cameras are like the cheapest, best investment you could ever make. The price of cameras has gone down 75% in the last two years. And it's so easy to hook them up to be actively monitored, meaning that they're going to have a little picture for every place there's a camera. You're going to be able to look at a computer screen and see what's, what's there. It's done locally. You can check it in one minute to get a faster response. You can also have it. Parkland, they are so careful about now. There's always police cars there every single day now. So they could actually hook up to the monitoring if they had it, which they don't at this time, and see what's happening at that school. The other thing is you have ID badges. So if you had students wearing ID badges and you just shot 17 people, you wouldn't be able to walk out because they would instantly catch you because you didn't have your badge on. The other thing we recommend is that encourage people to use bullet resistant materials. So there are all these bullet resistant materials, everything from whiteboards that you can take in your room and lock the door and stick, hold that whiteboard up. A, a bullet, a door doesn't stop a bullet. Most, most doors, a bullet goes right through the door. If you have one of these bullet resistant whiteboards, it's going to stop it. They also have material you can sew in a backpack and a kid can hold it up that cover their head or their in their stomach. Other thing is to have the active shooter training train students to run and practice evacuation drills. The other thing is keeping those outside gates locked. Again, this is something we see all the time. So, you know, the school's already invested. They've got the gates up everywhere. They have locks to the gates and everything's there and nobody goes out and does it. And so it's an accountability issue. If, you're, if we're paying you to make sure those gates are locked, they better lo be locked every single day. So the first one, of course, is access control. If you, can't, if you can't control access, you can't do anything. You could even use metal scanners that would take two minutes to scan a backpack. Easy. Limit the entrances we already talked about. Check the doors and their door alarms you can buy. Again, you could buy them on Amazon. They're so inexpensive. And it will alert you with a sound if the back door is open or on your computer screen. So I could put it on my laptop for my house and know when my, somebody comes in the back door. Again, adding more cameras, actively monitoring the cameras. In some places I've been doing assessments for active monitoring. I go in, they, they say, well, do you want to go in the IT closet? Sure, take me in the IT closet. And there's their monitoring cameras. So monitoring should be done at the front by the receptionist, but instead it's locked in an IT closet in the back. We've also had, because the weather is damp down here, we've had, I went into one, uh, one five-story facility where they told me, oh yeah, well, you know, I said, well, what do you, what do, you do to keep people in here to so make sure they don't go down the back stairwell? Well, we have door alarms. Okay, well, open the door and let me listen to it. So open the door, I'd hear nothing. You're standing too close. Okay, I walk three feet away. Open the door and tell me. Nothing. So uh, then I go up and I get a ladder. I climb up to the ceiling and find out that the contact points are rusted together. So I can go one foot away, 20 feet away. I can go in and out the stairwell all day and it's never going to work. So parking lots can also be monitored with cameras for early detection. Uh, color ID badges cost almost nothing again. He wouldn't have looked like everybody else if he didn't have a badge. Then train students to run. Not, I'm not a believer in hide because you, if you hide, somebody with a height with an automatic weapon can walk in and kill 30 kids in less than under two minutes. So that's why run is always listed first. Run, hide, fight. A bullet can only go in a straight line. So if you send kids out and have them run, it's not likely the casualties are going to be significantly reduced. But again, you have to train them. So the final version of the bill that they passed in Florida includes raise, raising the age to purchase a firearm to 21 from 18, requiring a three-day waiting period, banning the sale of bump stocks, giving law enforcement more authority to seize weapons and ammunition, 
from those who have mental problems like Nicholas Cruz and also provide additional funding. So uh, how, what do you do after this happens? So that was my, I started doing a, a lot of webinars and just on this subject. So what do you do after you know this has happened? What do you do at your school when you go in on Monday? This was on a Wednesday. So what do you do next Monday? And so we have a roadmap on how to keep your organization safe and secure. And it's all based, as Mike said, on these risk assessments. We get info from security vendors to establish a guide to best practices. And that's what we're working on with our police chiefs, coalition of police chiefs. We also have a network of security consultants that we can bring in to help do assessments in case we get have too many people who need them. But, but the first thing is awareness. And that's why I said it can't happen here because I hear that all the time. Every time I go, I go try to go as many places as I can where they've had a major active shooter incident. And maybe it's the principal, maybe it's the doctor, maybe it's the, maybe it's the, the uh, police chief who says, I can't believe it happened here. I thought we had everything under control. But th it's happened everywhere. It's happens in offices, law firms. It happened in Lowe's the other day. Guy got fired went into Lowe's in his office, sat down and killed himself in his office. Um, military installations, hospitals, beauty parlors, churches. I can't think of one place where they have it that doesn't have the potential to be a major, major active shooter site. And that means we could all be the victim of an active shooter at any time. So when we come out and do an assessment we analyze and look at all the data. So we look at the industry data, we look at all the crime data, we look at the assets you have, the value of that facility, the value of those students' lives. They've already gotten $15 million in lawsuits. So the whole point of doing this is reduce liability. So you're not gonna have, not only you're gonna not gonna have anybody die, but you're not gonna be sued for anything because by doing this kind of a risk assessment that's created by auditors, you're going to be able to say that you've done everything possible by having the risk assessment. We also survey the staff to rate their compliance and awareness. We rate the implementation of all the potential controls, and there are about 45 of them I recommend. And then we prepare action reports, as I said, based on return on investment. So we also look at your emergency policies and procedures, your communications plans, do training and drills, and most other kinds of organizations like healthcare already have this required. So this is our security program. It starts with looking at all these threat numbers, looking at how critical your assets are, surveying the staff to find out what's really going on, evaluating the implementation level of your controls, and then giving you a corrective action plan so you can say, okay, first quarter we're going to do this, second quarter we're going to do this, and make it affordable, but at the same time, you're doing the thing that's going to give you the most protection for the least amount of money. So we look at the assets. We look at all the threat data from all these different sources. We look at uh, all the mass casualty data, and then we go in and look at, we aggregate these together. So we look at the occurrences at your school, the occurrences in uh, other places, the state and county data. We look at the FBI Uniform Crime Index, and then we average them all together. So now we have a realistic idea of how often this occurs in your organization. Then we look at all the controls and measure how much they're implemented. Are they partially implemented, fully implemented? Are they used correctly? Do you have controls that staff are trained on? And then we go start going through the controls. So this is a subset of some of the ones we'd look at for active shooter. Access control systems, panic alarms, Panic alarms cost $10, $12 to get a panic alarm that's going to notify the whole school. It's going to scream. All you have to do is pull on it. And we recommend these for everybody who's sitting near an entrance anywhere. Barriers and gates, so you keep these things locked. Uh, bollards, so people can't drive right into the front of the school. Bomb threat procedures, monitoring cameras, cameras in the proper locations. And then here's your return on investment. So it says, what do you need? You need to have a security staff. How much would it cost? $15,000 a year. And that means that the return on investment is 15,000 to one. That means for every dollar you spend on this, it's going to save you $15,000 in liability by reducing the likelihood that something like this is going to occur. So again, it lists the controls by return on investment using real money. So bottom line for me is this is now, it's not just a job, it's a mission. I work on it 24 hours a day, every weekend. 
We want to protect people and prevent these active shooter incidents before they happen. Because I don't like talking about it. I don't want to have to spend the next 10 years talking about it. I want to get everybody safe as soon as possible. So you should talk to your management about what you need to secure your school. We've done everything from elementary schools, community colleges, universities. It all starts with a security risk assessment. Performing integrated assessment is going to get you the best bang for your buck. If you'd like a copy of the slides or get on my risk alert list, this is my email. You can write it down or ask Mike for it later. Caroline at riskandsecurityllc.com. And I'm Parkland Strong. So this is my direct phone line. You can also call me anytime. I always tell people too, when I, especially when I do training, that if you have a security incident you'd like to discuss, just call me anytime. Uh, I do a lot of active shooter training too, and every class that I go to now, five or ten people in that class have already been through an active shooter incident somewhere, which is very sad commentary on our time. So, uh, any anybody have any questions, Mike? Awesome, Carolyn. If you don't mind, stop sharing your screen, and um, I can take back over. I think we do have one question here. You're back over. Awesome. I see the question down here. Let's see. Will we have access to this PowerPoint presentation? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we can uh, get you that. We, I also uh, have recorded this. So if there's others on your team that you would like to uh, review all of this information and listen to the webinar, probably have this up on our website in the next 24 hours or so. Um, where can we help? Uh, you know, Carolyn talked a lot about, obviously, the assessment is the foundation. Um, and, you know, we've got tools, you know, like Save Visitor that we developed that manages not only visitors, volunteers, contractors, vendors. We're going to facial recognition. We had a partner in this week that we're getting ready to move forward with them. They've created incredible communication pieces. They've got video analytics. Um, things that can work within the cameras and can be then pushed uh, to security or law enforcement. Um, we have created a toolkit where we have vetted, you know, who has the best products, uh, who provides the best service. And so that's really what we've become as kind of a hub. You know, some of these things we own, some of these things we have uh, partnered with many, many different organizations like Carolyn's around the country. So, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, provide a lot of guidance um, to where you need to go once you've got that assessment completed. Um, here's all my information. Um, if you have questions or additional questions or think of anything after we get off the webinar, this is how you get a hold of me. That's my direct line. Otherwise, uh, we appreciate everybody taking some time out of their day. We know you guys are really busy. We appreciate that. Um, and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. And thanks to you, Carolyn, for participating. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you, everybody. And again, don't feel shy about calling. And thank you for this opportunity, Mike. I really enjoy working with you guys. You bet. Great day to everybody.